Good morning. I'm going to be discussing our recent work investigating the state of public key cryptography on the internet. This was a work conducted at the University of Michigan at UC San Diego with Nadia Henninger, Eric Wistro, Alex Halderman, and myself. So there's been a long history of security vulnerabilities that have been caused by poor random number generation, the most notably being the Netscape SSL vulnerability in 1996, and more recently, the Debian weak keys. And while we can all agree that these incidents had quite severe impact, they were only found by stumbling upon repeated keys or by close inspection of specific implementations. Earlier this year, our team decided we want to inspect the state of, public crypto state of public key cryptography on the internet. However, instead of investigating specific implementations as had been done in the past, we took a different approach. We searched for vulnerabilities that could be found by analyzing the entire universe of keys as a whole. Specifically, we analyzed the cryptographic keys used by the two most common cryptographic protocols on the internet, TLS and SSH. So in order to investigate these keys at a global scale, we first started by performing a comprehensive scan of hosts on the internet. We did this for both TLS and SSH, ultimately finding 29 million TLS hosts and 23 million SSH hosts. And this was really inspired by the SSL Observatory project, which had scanned the internet earlier. But instead of looking at the certificate authority ecosystem like that team had, we decided instead to look at the cryptographic keys in use. And we performed the scan first in the first step by just finding hosts that had port 443 or 22 open. And we performed this by running nmap in a distributed manner across 25 EC2 hosts. And we were able to perform the scan of the entire IPv4 address space in approximately 24 hours. At this point, we had this list of hosts. And we went through and we performed an SSH handshake or TLS handshake with each of these hosts in an event-driven manner, either in Python or C, with twisted or lib event. And in approximately 48 hours, we were able to pull down and process all of the TLS certificates and SSH keys that we could find on the internet. So we have this database. We have this global perspective. But what do we look for? And the first obvious thing to look for is repeated keys. From the standpoint of a theoretical cryptographer, we wouldn't expect to see any repeated keys. We'd hope that each host presented a unique cryptographic key. But as is very evident, there are far fewer distinct keys than there are for live hosts. In fact, there are less than half. So why do so many hosts share keys? And there are a lot of legitimate reasons this can happen. We can't say this is all bad. And the first one that becomes very obvious is that corporations have many web servers. If we look at the number of web servers Google has running TLS, we see hundreds of thousands. Each of these may be serving the same certificate. In some cases, they may have different certificates for different domains, but they all share a public key. And there's really nothing vulnerable offhand about this. Similarly, there are many shared hosting providers out there that create certificates for each of their users. So we see different certificates for each one of these companies. They may look completely unrelated. But if you start to look at the IP space, you'll notice that they're all on sequential IPs. They're all clearly managed by the same group. However, we also found keys that were shared improperly. And there are two main reasons we found for this. The first was default keys and certificates. And this really occurred because we have lots of devices out on the internet. We're seeing firewalls and routers, voice over IP devices, server management cards. A lot of these are shipped with these default certificates and keys, and they're never changed by end users. We see this for both consumer devices, everything from cable modems to these enterprise devices, such as server management cards. And in most of the manuals, they'll say, you should change your key when you first use this device. But no one ever does. And we find that over 5% of TLS hosts on the internet are using these default keys and certificates. And we're able to identify these pretty easily, because most of them say straight out, this is a default certificate for this device by this manufacturer. And all of them will share the same certificate. But as we started to remove all these classes of devices, we've removed these corporations that are sharing certificates. We've removed these certificates for the shared hosting providers. We remove these default certificates and keys. We start to find these certificates that are generated by each device. Each device has a different certificate. But very suspiciously, they all have the same public key. 
In the case of TLS, we find that there's approximately a fourth of a percent of the TLS hosts on the internet which are generating these keys, but are generating duplicated keys. In the case of SSH, we found a total of 9.6% of the SSH hosts utilize shared keys for one of these reasons. Either they were default keys or they were generated with low entropy. And when we start to go through all these devices, it starts to become very clear that these are all headless embedded devices. We aren't seeing these on signed certificates. We aren't seeing these on e-commerce sites, Bank of America. We're seeing these on embedded devices, most of which are very easily classifiable. So these shared keys, they do pose a risk because anyone who has this device can potentially extract this pub private key from the device. If I have it on my server, I can read the traffic coming from yours. And I can potentially also impersonate your device to someone else on the internet. But we also see people take the whole step further. We find tutorials that talk about these Apache snake oil keys. These are keys that are often included by default. We'll see them referenced in the manual. We'll see a file name that says, OK, use this PEM file. And people take this to the whole point of just using that default key. And we found 22 CA signed certificates. These were for businesses that just copied the key from the snake oil certificate. So these default keys are also posing a risk because people are using them for other processes. And the lesson really here is that users kind of follow your directions. They'll set up a certificate. They'll follow your command line instructions. But if you say, use this file, um, they will. And so you end up with these default keys, which if you Google for, you can easily find the corresponding private key on the internet. So these keys do pose some risk. If I have the same device as someone else on the internet, we may be able to decrypt each other's traffic. But there are far worse problems that can arise from poorly generated keys. And given that 99% of the TLS certificates we saw used RSA encryption, we decided to take a further look at RSA. So in RSA keys, when we generate a public key, we're first generating these two very large primes, P and Q. And this public key is composed of two components. One is this modulus, N, which is the product of P and Q, and a public exponent, E. And at the current time, there's no known method of factoring a 1,024-bit certificate. The largest known factored certificate is 768 bits, which was factored after a multi-year distributed computing effort. So this really isn't within the easy reach. And there are no known methods. However, if one of these prime numbers is shared between two keys, and only one of the primes, then we can efficiently compute the GCD of these two numbers of these two public keys. And this takes approximately 15 microseconds to perform on a desktop computer. The problem is, given the large number of keys we found, to do a pairwise comparison of all of the keys in our data set, it would take approximately 30 years, which was out of our budget range and outside of the easily accessible computing power. So that's out. Not going to happen. However, there is a little less naive way of doing this, and we implemented an algorithm previously published by Dan Bernstein. And in this, what we're effectively doing is creating a product tree of all the moduli we find, and then dividing out with this remainder tree. And using this implementation, we can effectively compute the pairwise GCD of all the keys in our data set. However, we're able to do this in under two hours on EC2 for a total cost of $5. So, in the perfect world, we'd expect to see no of these prime factors shared. We hope that each instance would generate their own primes. But we found that over 2,000 prime factors were shared among the RSA keys in use on the internet. And with these 2,000 prime factors, we were able to efficiently compute the private keys for half a percent of the hosts providing TLS certificates on the internet. However, this isn't a huge issue. Just like the shared keys that were generated with poor entropy, these, this is not Bank of America. These are not e-commerce sites. These are the same embedded devices we saw before that had shared keys. These are headless embedded network devices. These are the routers. These are firewalls. And these are management cards. The types of devices we'd see collecting poor entropy. In this case, instead of generating two primes that were repeated, they're only generating one. 
So we took a look at RSA because it's most commonly used in TLS, but in the case of SSH, most of the SSH hosts we saw were also serving DSA keys along with RSA keys. And just like RSA, DSA also has its weaknesses. DSA is the US government's federal digital, sign digital signature algorithm. And it has two properties um, that make it vulnerable to keys that are ge poorly generated. The first is that if an adversary can guess the randomness that was used to generate a signature, that they can easily compute the private key. And secondly, if the same randomness is used to generate two different messages, then it's possible to compute this randomness. So we can see here, putting these two together, if a machine signs two different messages with the same randomness, we can trivially compute its private key. So when we were performing our SSH scan, we collected this shared randomness, or we collected signatures along with the SSH keys and looked for signatures that were sharing randomness. And what we found was that approximately 4,000 of the signatures did, uh, 4,000 of the signatures did share uh, these ephemeral keys, this randomness. And these weren't, this wasn't the case that we were seeing a single machine use the same randomness twice. Instead, we were seeing machines that generated the same randomness deterministically across multiple machines, and each of these machines might be generating the same randomness. And because they all had the same private key, we were able to, they were effectively compromising each other. And after compromising these private keys, we were able to compute the private keys for approximately 100,000 or 1% 1 of SSH hosts on the internet. So when we investigate this, we found several faulty software implementations. And again, similar to the last two cases, we found a large number of devices that were generating these keys. So we've talked about these devices a lot. They're generating the weak DSA keys, the weak RSA keys, and these repeated keys. But what are they? We ultimately ended up identifying devices from over 40 manufacturers. There's consumer devices, there are enterprise devices. It's everything from routers to management cards to voice over IP phones. And what's in common here is these are devices that are automatically generating keys on first boot. There's these headed, headless embedded devices, and there's a lot of them. This isn't just one or two bad implementations, a manufacturer that made a mistake. These are widespread issues that are across a variety of device types and across a variety of manufacturers. And the only thing in common is that they're generating keys on first boot. So naturally, we decided to take this one step further and say, so why so many devices? What's really in common here? What's going on? And so in, order to in order to have a better understanding, we take a deeper look at some of the software that was being used to generate these keys. And we decided to investigate OpenSSL and Linux because while they weren't the only platforms we saw generating these keys, a large number of the keys were generated using Linux. But we also saw keys being generated on BSD and using software on Windows. But they were common, they were frequent, and they were easily accessible because they were open source implementations. So when we start to look at these cryptographic libraries, the first thing that we find is that everything uses DevU random. And if you look at the man page for DevU random, the first thing it'll tell you is never use DevU random for generating cryptographic keys. Use it for everything but generating cryptographic keys. Yet, every cryptographic implementation we find uses DevU random. And the reason is because Dev random blocks, it's quite unpredictable. And it can hang indefinitely, especially on devices which do have low entropy, which are unable to, to, unable to gather entropy. This could hang indefinitely, which just isn't acceptable. So instead, you'll see comments that say, eh, if you random's good enough, we'll be fine. So what goes into DevU random? What's actually going on? The Linux kernel maintains several what we call entropy pools. And the first one where everything enters in is this input pool. And this is where all this raw entropy joins together. And we're seeing 
keyboard and mouse movements, we're seeing disk access timing, and we're seeing time of boot being fed into this input pool, the vast majority of which was mostly disk access timing. However, if we go back and we consider the devices we just talked about, these embedded devices, we can start crossing these out. None of these things have keyboard or mice. Most of these don't even have spindle-based disks. If they have any disk, it's either solid state a lot of times it's something very small with a custom driver that doesn't even bother to add entropy into the entropy pool. So we can continue to cross them out. In a lot of cases, we further believe there isn't any real-time clock. All of these devices start up at time zero and will later on gather time during the boot process, but at the time when they're seeded into DevU random, it's deterministic. So the first problem we see here is that these embedded devices are lacking, in some cases, all of the entropy sources that you would expect on Linux. However, it gets better. This input pool collects entropy, but it just sits around in the entropy pool until you reach 192 bits. And until then, none of that entropy is actually accessible in DevU random, in what we call the non-blocking pool. And so you may have collected entropy, but as long as it's under 192 bits, none of it is accessible, and you'll have a completely deterministic DevU random. So what does this really mean? So here we're looking at a graph of an instrumented kernel we wrote that keeps track of randomness as it is mixed into the Linux kernel. And this is kind of a what you'd expect desktop system running Ubuntu server. And what we see here um, is right around 65 seconds is where we reach 192 bits of entropy. So before 65 bits, or before 65 seconds, if you query DevU random, which many things do, you have deterministic randomness on your first boot. Now, this isn't as much of an issue on subsequent boots because as shutdown, randomness is safe to disk, and it will be reloaded back in on your next boot. But on first boot, for these first 65 seconds, we have what we'll end up calling this boot entropy hole. And this red line is actually where OpenSSH uh, pulls from DevU random, which is at about four seconds, so a good minute before we reach 192 bits. So this explains some of the problems we observed, but not all. And so if we consider how our key is generated, we might say, okay, we're going to seed from this random pool, we'll pull from DevU random, and we're going to generate our two primes, P and Q. In this case, we'd expect to see repeated keys. The same randomness is being pulled in at the beginning, these two keys are being generated, but we wouldn't necessarily expect to see factorable keys. Because here, if you have the same randomness, that same randomness is used to generate both primes, both of the primes will be shared, or neither of them will be shared. However, what we can consider is what would cause these factorable keys to be generated. And one possibility is if we add more randomness in between generating these two primes, if we add it in during the middle of this key generation process, we could see that the first prime ends up being the same across all of these hosts, but we add more randomness in the middle, and that second prime ends up being different. In this case, we could end up with a factorable key because this second prime starts to vary and we have this distribution. And what we find is that OpenSSL is indeed updating the entropy pool. It's not this exact setup, but it is updating the entropy pool during the key generation process, which may be leading to these factorable keys. So where does this additional randomness come from, though? If, there's, if it's deterministic at the beginning and we generate one prime, where's the additional um, randomness coming from? And what we start to see is OpenSSL adds the current time in seconds to the randomness pool between these operations. And this can be affected by clock drift. These are devices without real-time clocks or these small embedded devices. These clocks aren't 100% accurate between devices, and this slight drift causes these primes to differ slightly. One thing we want to note, though, is that this isn't just a reduced key space. In this graph, we see what we'd expect from a typical distribution. We see one prime that's shared. This is what a lot of the devices we saw were. In fact, this is what all but one of the devices we saw was except for one device, um, which was an IBM remote access card, uh, which humorously only generated nine primes total ever. And so your entropy is nine choose two. Um, so 
but all of the other cases um, were, did not have this uniform distribution. They were much closer to what we saw on the left. So we found a lot of products. Um, we ended up contacting over 60 companies regarding these vulnerabilities, and we had quite an experience doing this. About only 10 of the companies we found had security contact information posted anywhere that we could find. Approximately out of the 60 we contacted, approximately 20 responded ever in the last four months. And three of us, three of them have informed us of security advisories regarding their products. We recently started um, collaborating with US CERT, which has helped some. But at this point, we still have not received responses from all of the companies. Secondly, we have been working closely with the Linux kernel team to patch the kernel to make changes that might help prevent this from happening again, even if device manufacturers don't end up fixing the product on their own. And the Linux kernel team has sent, we've added randomness from interrupts, which provides a new source of entropy that was not being pulled from before. And we've also started to add unique identifiers from network devices. You have your MAC address, you have unique identifiers on certain other hardware devices in your computer. And by adding these in into the entropy pool, we'll end up with devices not generating these repeated keys. Because even though this isn't true entropy, it is unique. And it helps us reduce this problem. And lastly, um, entropy is gathered much more quickly in the early boot process, such that this 192-bit threshold isn't reached a minute after boot. It's reached much more close, much more, much sooner before devices would actually be, before services, I'm sorry, would start to request entropy from the kernel. We also decided to send disclosures to some end users, which we found doing terrible things. Um, one of the further cases we found were Citrix Remote Access um, its services oftentimes came with default keys or certificates. And similar to the snake oil keys, users would take these keys and they would add them and they'd get a signed certificate. But in this case, we found Fortune 500 companies, hospitals, healthcare companies, law firms, the Puget Sound Transit Authority, and the US Navy using these default keys to protect production remote access services. So it's everyone. And Contacting these end users companies went even worse for us than contacting uh, most of the companies, the manufacturers. In most of the cases, we, they called us and just yelled at us about how we didn't understand cryptography. And if we knew what we were doing, we'd know what they were doing was perfectly secure. That was all of them. We didn't receive a single positive response. So there are a lot of mitigations possible. We can add more entropy sources. In some cases, the kernel just needs to be collecting from these existing sources more, more aggressively. In other cases, we can add hardware sources of entropy. And there really needs to be better communication between the OS and applications. Dev random and urandom are not providing the services users need. Lastly, we've created a public key check service for end users where they can check keys on their devices to see if they're vulnerable to these RSA, DSA, or shared keys vulnerabilities. But is this the tip of an iceberg? We're mainly seeing devices we expect that don't have real-time clocks. And can real-time clocks mask more serious entropy problems? We won't see the exact same keys, but they may be vulnerable to targeted attacks. If an attacker can find the, the time of the initial boot, they have a reduced key space to search through. And they may be able to go through and compute this key. Further, on traditional PCs, the margin of safety we saw for keys being generated on the first boot is slim. And this might be helped by the new kernel patches. And we weren't able to observe anything exploitable so far, but it's close enough that it's not quite comfortable. In terms of future work, we looked at two specific cryptographic protocols, RSA and DSA, but there are many more out there that have similar vulnerabilities. And there are other non-cryptographic impacts that this boot entropy hole could have. TCP sequence number, ASLR, this address space randomization may be seeded so quickly after boot. Is this also using randomness from this boot time hole? And there are also further applications from using this top-down methodology. What can we find from a global perspective that we can't find from just looking at a single key? So in conclusion, we've studied entropy at a global perspective. We've looked at public keys for both TLS and SSH across the internet. We've found widespread vulnerabilities across embedded these headless network devices including that over 5% of TLS and 9% of SSH hosts are using vulnerable 
potentially vulnerable shared keys, that half a percent of TLS hosts are using factorable RSA keys, and that 1% of, of SSH hosts are using repeated DSA randomness and computable DSA private keys. So problems with random number generation are still pervasive in certain devices, and random number generation is still a difficult problem. Thank you. Uh, questions? So we have, we have time for questions, so please go ahead. Uh, hi, Perry Metzger, University of Pennsylvania. Um, I've long contended that embedded systems should probably get, because they already have some customization like MAC address, et cetera, put into their flash at, at the factory, probably should get a deterministically generated pseudo-random seed. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I say deterministically because it, it, if you leave it to some sort of at true random hardware at the factory and it fails, no one's ever going to notice, whereas repeated iterations of AES probably uh, are actually more reliable. Uh, do you think that it would be, that it's better for, to, from a threat model point of view, to do things like the Linux patching you've done, or would it be better for, to trust the factory to, to put a random number in, even though in theory that means that the factory knows things about how your hardware is going to behave. I mean, I think there are pros and cons to both. Um, the Linux kernel doesn't necessarily solve the problem. We're collecting entropy more aggressively, but if the sources are still not there, they're not there. Um, at the same time, we can see with the Intel CPUs, just adding the random number generator on the CPU has caused a lot of, I don't want to say uproar, but conversations about is that truly random? How do we test that? And so. Yes, it's an option, um, and it has its pros and cons just like any other. Hi, great talk, Ian Goldberg, University of Waterloo. Uh, this reminds me of uh, when Ben Laurie in 2004 uh, did the same thing for PGP keys, yeah. and of course there were way fewer, so he didn't have to do the clever Bernstein trick. Mm -hmm. And he did the GCD of all PGP keys on the key servers and found a GCD of nine. Think about that for a bit. <laughs> Nine isn't even prime, mm -hmm. right? So did you find, <laughs> it's true. So it's true, nine isn't prime. So <laughs> <laughs> um, did you try to do any uh, like simple factorization, like even just look for small factors to see if there are any really crazy things going on, like even worse than this? Oh, we, I don't think we checked independently. Nadia would be the better source on this. Um, I don't, there may have been a few devices, but do you have a better answer? There were a lot of questionable keys, but it wasn't. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter Neumann, SRI, quick question. I presume you have seen email uh, saying that if, uh, if I would send my private key or one of my uh, primes uh, to this service, they would tell me whether it had been compromised. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how do we know that uh, your site uh, has not been Trojan horsed or something so like that? So we're not requesting private keys. We're only requesting public keys. Uh, Adam Langley, Google. So people try to get CAs signed with default keys at quite a frequent rate, from what I understand from CAs. Okay. But CAs should block it, and yep. if you let me know which CAs didn't, I can lean on them to get it fixed. We'll do. We'll talk. Bill Cheswick, your institution name here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> have you done any hunting to see if these sorts of attacks are found in the wild, like set up a honeypot or see if people are actually doing this, because I, I assume they are. Well, they certainly will now. <laughs> um, we haven't. And in some ways, what we're doing is collecting keys. And so there are a lot of scanners going through the internet searching for keys and making connections on these ports, but it isn't necessarily clear what their motivation is just by seeing that traffic. OK. Uh, William Simpson, I actually want to thank you very much for doing this because you managed to get some fixes into the Linux kernel. I never was able to get the fixes that we proposed about the time that Yarrow came out to the Linux kernel, and Ted So's response was 
that uh, the random number generation for Linux was not an IETF consensus-based project. It was, you know, whatever he decided. And so there are other things that they need to get in. For instance, every TCP packet or um, Ethernet packet that shows up in the interface has a very random piece of authenticator at the end of it, which being added into the pool will give you some more bits of mm -hmm. non-deterministic information that would be there very, very early. Yes, it's observable, but only if you happen to be on the link. And uh, that, uh, anyway, thank you very much for managing to get the Linux kernel people to move at all. Sure, and there's conversation that's still going on about what to add in. Um, I can send you information on that um, if you want to suggest that. At this point, they seem fairly receptive to ideas now that they've seen that this is actually a problem. Now, now that we've had a published paper. Ex exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay.